Welcome to Clued in Mystery. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brooke. And we both love mystery. Hi, Brooke. Hi, Sarah. I'm so excited to be talking to you again. I know. It feels like it's been so long. I know. Did you have a good summer break? I did. Thank you. And what about you? Did you get to read a lot? I did a lot of reading and a lot of soaking up a lot of hot, hot sun. So it was definitely the summer vibes here. Perfect. So let's talk about what we've been reading. Yes. Why don't I get us started? Um, I don't remember the order that we talked about the books when we um, originally shared our reading lists. So this is in no particular order. But I'm going to start with Warrior Girl Unearthed, which is uh, a YA novel by Angeline Bully. And this was the second book that I've read by her. And I think it was her second her second release. And I, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, I did find, though, that the mystery wasn't quite as gripping as her first book, Firekeeper's Daughter, but it was definitely worth it to read. And I do hope that she continues to write in this community. So both books uh, take place in the same place, but uh, about a decade apart. Uh, and so it was interesting to see, you know, how some of the characters in the first book had grown and what had happened to them since since that. But the this book was really focused on a, a whole different set of characters. Interesting. Yeah, that seems like a, a cool way to run a series with you have that long time span. It'd be kind of interesting to see, like you say, what happened to characters. So um, that sounds great. And again, I think the same. I'm not sure what order I talked about things, but my first one that I will recap is my nonfiction pick, which was Mystery of Mysteries, The Life and Death of Edgar Allan Poe by Mark Davidziak. And um, this was a great dual timeline rendition of Poe's life. I'm not sure I've read a lot like this. Like, So they had the one uh, timeline that was just a straight biography, uh, chronological, I should say. And then the other one was sort of a um, zoom in of the last days of Poe's life, because that's the crux of this is how and why did he die? That's such a mystery. And I said when I presented the book that Davidziak was wanting to pose the um, idea that that the stereotype of Poe that we've always held as this dreary, miserable alcoholic is all wrong, and that this is in large part because his arch nemesis, Rufus Griswold, is the one who wrote his first obituary just a few days after his death. So um, he spends a large part of the book talking about this discrepancy, and I'm not completely swayed. I think that what he says about Poe is true, that his innate personality was probably quite fun and outgoing and, and quirky. But um, his writing really does support the fact that he has this other side of him too. And I think that it's probably a nature nurture situation. His life circumstances really shaped the way that his life went. You know, he had a lot of sadness, a lot of death. So I think that they're both true. And in fact, I think that makes me love him even more because that's what we want in literature is this light and dark push and pull. But the real crux of the book is this like, why and how did Poe die? And I am so interested in the author's um, theory, which is tuberculosis. We know that Poe had a lot of people in his family die of tuberculosis. It was a, you know, epidemic at that point in history. But what I didn't know was there is a latent form of the disease that you can be sort of a carrier of a chronic latent version, not the acute version that we most identify with tuberculosis. Uh, and it can actually cause mental health issues and some underlying health conditions that could perhaps explain some of Poe's erratic behavior and strange uh, decision making processes throughout his life. In the end, we'll never know, of course, why he died, and of, that is um, enduring as well because it reminds us that some mysteries aren't meant to be solved. So I highly recommend this one if you are a Poe um, fan like I am. Well, that sounds like it was a great read, uh, Brooke, and I don't think I realized that his obituary was written by um, his arch nemesis, as you described him. What a fascinating 
piece of history. Exactly. And it really can explain a lot of why the commu- the larger community got an idea of Poe that stuck. So um, yeah, it was, it was really worth a, a worthwhile read. And did the book explain why that was the person who wrote his obituary? Well, he was very popular as well um, as a publisher and um, critic as Poe was. And I think, honestly, he jumped at the chance because he really did hate Edgar Allan Poe. So it was a very pointed, pointed decision. Wow. Okay, I'm going to have to go and read if nothing else, read the obituary and just see what, uh, what an enemy can do. (laughs) That's a great idea. Maybe we'll post it as well in the show notes. That's, That's a terrific idea. So I also read, well, I didn't get through it, uh, a nonfiction. So my intention was to read all of The Life of Crime by Martin Edwards, which is really a history of crime writing. And it's, it, it's such a good book and it's so well researched and there's so much detail that, uh, you know, I found myself taking notes and really wishing actually that I had a physical copy. I only had um, an electronic copy from, from the library, but I'm going to uh, pick up a physical copy because I think I want my own that I can leave my own sticky notes in. And I've got some ideas, I think, for some, some future episodes. And certainly we can use the research and references in it um, when, we're, when we're doing our deep dives into into different authors because it was or and and different genres because it was just it it's a really fantastic read and um yeah I need to I think I need to have it in my hands Mm -hmm. and I need to have my own copy I I can't rely on the library's copy (laughs) I feel that way too whenever I have one of those really meaty non-fictions it's like I just have to own it and mark it up. And like you say, sticky note it. Um, and I can't wait to uh, find out all the good details you're going to pull out of it for future episode ideas, Sarah. The next on my list, I was calling it Instagram made me do it because it was one of those that I kept seeing the cover over and over and it lured me in. And this is Murder Your Employer by Rupert Holmes. It's a brand new release, 2023. Um, and the setup is that there is this McMaster's Conservatory for the Applied Arts where students go to school to learn how to, quote unquote, delete their most deserving victim. Um, I loved this book. It was so different, so unique. Um, I'm really hoping that someone picks it up to make it a television series. I just keeping my fingers crossed because this dark university atmosphere, I think it's just begging to be visually uh, adapted. Um, So this is a very tongue in cheek. I was saying lemony snicket for adults, kind of a story um, where their classes are based around how to, you know, do car chases and how, how to uh, poison someone. And the PE is all about like breaking and entering and it's just really great. Um, So we see in the first part of the book, the crimes being reverse engineered because the student's thesis is to plan this perfect crime. And they have all these professors with different backgrounds and specialties that are helping them come up with all the the perfect crimes. scenarios. And then the second half of the book, we follow those characters out into the world where they attempt to pull off their murders and complete their thesis. And uh, without giving anything away, some succeed and some do not, but I highly recommend it. It's it's just a really cool take on the mystery genre and um, it is being billed as book one. So I'm assuming this is going to be a series. Oh, that sounds that sounds really great, Brooke. Um, I'll have to I'll have to look for a copy and and check it out. There were a couple of authors that I wanted to uh, read some of their backlists, and one of those was Ruth Ware. So last year we did the Woman in Cabin Ten as our first "What Would You Do" episode, uh, and that was the first of Ruth Ware's books that I had ever read. And so I thought, well, you know, I enjoyed that. I should read another of hers. And so I started with "In a Dark, Dark Wood," which um, I believe was her first book. Um, I think so, and. 
I thought it was I I so I thought I thought it was really good. It has, you know, an author as the as the main character. Uh, I'm not going to say a sleuth cuz she's not well, I guess there's there's definitely a mystery, but it's not like a classic mystery. Um but, you know, it's former friends who have gathered in a in a remote cabin. There's lots of manipulation and secrets. Um I do think I preferred The Woman in Cabin 10. Um and I don't know I don't know why, um, but yeah, there was something about this one that maybe just felt a little bit too unrealistic. Mm-hmm. I don't know, um, but I will definitely read some more by Ruth Ware because it was it was highly entertaining and and I really did enjoy it. Sarah, did you um, what format did you read this one in? I listened to it. Yeah, and do you agree? Do you love her narrator? Yes, absolutely. I think she yeah. makes, she does a really great job. That's great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I think that I agree with your um, with your rating there. The next one on my list is I was billing it a cozy read as a cozy author. And it, it's The Christy Curse by Victoria Abbott. It's a little older. It came out in 2013. And it's the first in her book collector series. Um, this was a great setup. Her main character's name is Jordan Kelly, and I liked how original this character was because she comes from a crime family. So um, she has this secret that she needs to keep. She uses a different surname so that people aren't familiar with the fact that she's the niece of these uh, guys who are all in professional crime. But she has these built-in heavies or people to help her do some of the nefarious stuff. So that's a cool um, a cool aspect of the story. She's hired as a researcher by this rich old woman to find this rumored play that Agatha Christie supposedly wrote during the 11 days when she was missing. The mystery plot is pretty good. It drags some in the middle. But I think my biggest critique is that the mystery doesn't hinge around the play and Agatha's disappearance enough. And we've talked about this before. It's a pet peeve of mine. If an author is going to use a a famous author's name or um, situation in the title or premise that you really have to lean heavily on it. And I think that there were a lot of opportunities to make this so much about Christie's disappearance and, and this play, which really drew me in and it, it didn't quite get there for me, but it was a, it was really great writing. She's a, she writes well, and I really liked this character and the, the, the whole family that she's from. So I would give it another go. And book two is Sayers Swindle with references to the great Dorothy Sayers. So maybe I'll have a report on that one in the future. That's such an interesting premise, both the idea of someone who comes from a crime family uh, and then layered on with Agatha Christie's life or or her disappearance. Uh, I agree with you. I think when a um, author is kind of using someone else's name to draw in readers, you really are setting up an expectation that that is going to be a key part of the book. So I can see how that would have been uh, disappointing to, to not have as much of that as, as you were hoping for. Yeah, exactly. So I actually ended up reading two books by Agatha Christie this summer. The one that I talked about in our um, summer reading list episode was Murder in Mesopotamia. And I have really mixed feelings about this book. So it is definitely of its time in how some of the characters are described, um, particularly at the beginning. Uh, And so that kind of made it difficult for me to get into the book. Um, But there were references to some of her other novels and some of the other crimes that um, uh, Hercule Poirot had been uh, involved in. So uh, I I liked that. And I really liked that the narrator was a woman, which I think that might have been the first of her books that I've read where um, where I've noticed that. Um, And you know, that just reminded me of how Agatha Christie didn't really stick to strict conventions in her writing, right? Like she uh, explored a lot of different ways of telling her stories. And I really like that about her. 
but yeah, this is probably my least favorite of her books that, that I've read. So because I was not so pleased with that, I picked up Cat Among the Pigeons, which is probably one of my favorite of her books that I've read. So it was a nice balance. (laughs) Um, And this one is set largely at a prestigious girls school. Someone's looking for some missing jewels and will kill to find them. Um, And the book did have a lot of characters, including Poirot, but he only appears really towards the last third of the book. That's not the first time that I've seen her doing that. So it's, you know, Bill is a Poirot mystery, but he's not the key character of the book, which again, I think is really interesting in the way that she approached her, her stories. Yeah, fascinating. It's interesting to me that you had that um, comparison, the one that you didn't so much like and the one that you did. And I think because exactly what you said, that she would play with different ways of telling stories, we really will have in the huge Christie canon ones that we like and ones that we don't like. Where there's other authors, and, and Ruth Ware is a great example for me personally, like I pretty much know if I pick it up because she has a very typical way to tell a story and I kind of know what I'm going to get. But with Christy, she can write a thriller. She can write um, a puzzle mystery and she'll tell the puzzle mystery in a different way every time. And very interesting. And to stay on the Agatha Christie topic, um, I also read one of her titles this time and I read 450 to Paddington. Um, I as well had a wonderful experience with this one. I think this might be my favorite non-thriller Christie novel because I tend to really love her thrillers. Like, And then there were none as an example. That's what I would call a thriller. Um, but I loved this puzzle mystery. This is a Miss Marple mystery. And I hadn't read much Miss Marple, um, mostly just watched, but I just really loved the way she told this story. And I also found a new favorite Christie character in Lucy Islesborough. So Lucy Islesborough is this like most sought after housekeeper. You can kind of think like Mary Poppins, but not a nanny, a housekeeper. She's like practically perfect in every way. She can do it all. She's like keeps the houses running just like at 100%. She can cook, she can clean, like everything's perfect when Lucy Alsborough's there. So Marple hires her to go to work in this manor house that's, you know, the one in question where the murders happened, right? So that um, Alsborough can be her intel. And then she tells everyone that Miss Marple is her elderly aunt living in the nearby village and they can get together and share information. Um, It was really, really well done. And I'm wondering actually if Agatha Christie was perhaps setting herself up to have this potential new main character sleuth, because I think Lucy really could have carried a series. She had this great reason to be in different homes, and she was, you know, like I say, billed as this super smart, super um, ingenious capable person. And I think she could have been a a main character sleuth, a sort of Miss Marple Tuppence mashup. But um, it was a great mystery, of course. And Miss Marple does, I will admit, kind of put things together in a fairly miraculous way at the end. But they do that and we don't mind. And we it was it was a fun read. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read that one. So maybe I'll um that, add that to my to read soon list as well. Mm-hmm. I know that Sue Grafton is is one of your favorites, Brooke. And after reading A is for Alibi, I know why, because I thought it was very good. Um, and in fact, I as soon as I finished that, started reading B is for Burglar. Um, and I had to stop myself from continuing down the list <laughs> because I knew that there were others that I needed to read this summer. So I found Kinsey Malone to be very relatable. And I think this is maybe going to be one of those series that I turn to uh, when I'm looking for almost a comfort read. So, you know, it's it, both books were, um, you know, she's investigating crimes, um, but just told in a way that was very, 
I don't know, it probably sounds weird to say it, but like, kind of like I was in a warm blanket. Like it wasn't, you know, it, it just was very, and maybe because they're set in the, in the 1980s, the early 1980s, because that's when they, these two books were published. Um, and you just sort of get this totally different feel of what life was like then. Mm hmm. Yeah. And she has a very easy way of writing. It just feels like you're having a conversation with someone. So I see what you mean about like a comfort read, because um, not at all to say that the mysteries aren't challenging and um, absorbing, but they're just so easy to read. So I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. <laughs> well, and I don't know why it took me so long to pick up a Sue Grafton, because um, Obviously, she's been around for a while, and and um, yeah, she's just one of those those authors that I knew I should read, um, and I'm really glad now that I've done. Awesome. Well, this one I was calling from my physical TBR stack that's beginning to topple. It was a paperback titled Stalking Jack the Ripper by Carrie Maniscalco. And this is a James Patterson imprint. He did a YA. I'm not sure if the YA line is still going, but this is from 2016. I mentioned that there was a little cringiness from the cover of this because it's definitely like a YA romance feel, but here we are talking about Jack the Ripper. But here's the deal. We still don't know who Jack the Ripper was, right? And what if he was this Ted Bundy or H. H. Holmes kind of guy who was known to be extremely handsome and charming and um, quite honestly someone that women would easily fall for? So yes, the idea of romance with Jack the Ripper is uh, very uncomfortable. It's also viable, I think. Um, I enjoyed the historical accuracy of the story. Um, she also put period photographs in the book, which I think uh, is probably a YA aspect of the of the paperback. Um, Maniscalco followed the timeline of the actual cases really well, so that you know, gave it some validity. Uh, our sleuth, Audrey Rose Wadsworth, is an apprentice to her uncle, who is a doctor and early medical examiner. And so this is what puts her in contact with the case. She did a great job of making every male character in the story seem guilty at one point or another. Like she hooked me in and I could fall for each of them. And especially the lead character's love interest. You know, he seems like he's the, the Ripper character. Um, but of course he's not. And the book is a great setup for the two of them to continue solving mysteries together. One of my favorite things about the book is it uh, explains who the Ripper was. You know, they discover who the bad guy is, but it also explains why it could never come to light for the public. So I liked this um, imagining that it was known, but it just simply couldn't be revealed because it would um, be so damaging. So it was it was fun. I I don't think it would be a series that I continue just because it's just not really my vibe, the YA romance slash suspense, but, um, but it was fun. And how did, how did it work? Cause I think we talked about this in our reading list episode about kind of the YA slash Jack the Ripper combination. Like did that, did that feel okay? It did. It did work. I mean, they're older. That's the other thing is like, you know, she, this Audrey is on the verge of being considered a spinster. So she's, you know, what would that be? <laughs> In those days, she was probably a whopping 23 or something, but um, she's considered an adult in her time period. So I think that helped, but I think it's still an age or group of uh, characters that would be interesting to YA readers. So it worked. It's interesting you say that because um, just thinking about the YA book that I read over the summer, the one by Angeline Bully, um, in her second book, the characters were a little bit younger than in the first book. So they were, mm. you know, 14, 15, I think, rather than 16, 17, 18 in her first book. And I think maybe that was one of the reasons that I didn't feel I enjoyed it quite as much as as the first book was that the characters were just a little bit younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that whole uh, category is really 
it's really uh, tricky to get the subject matter and the age of the characters right. And it, the wrong combination can can sour it one way or the other. So I have a final uh, book on my list, and that was your book, Brooke, The Cameo Secret. So I actually, so it's middle grade, which is even younger than, than YA. Mm-hmm. And I don't read a lot of that because my... Uh, my reader at home isn't quite there yet. We're still reading a lot of the early readers. Um, but I think it was a really interesting progression to see kind of the difference between those books, the early reader books, um, where my son is, and YA, which I absolutely love, um, and, you know, see that kind of middle ground with with middle grade. Um, I loved how much was going on in Jesse's poor Jesse's life. <laughs> <laughs> a new school, mean girls, her parents splitting up, a boy that was crushing on her and this mystery. And it just, you know, she had a lot on her little shoulders. Um, but you did such a great job of capturing the big feelings that accompany that age. Um, and I really loved the voice that you gave Jesse. Uh, it was, yeah, it was great. So I hope that there's going to be another uh, featuring Jesse and her and her friend Ian, right? Yeah, Ian. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. This has been a, a book that means a lot to me. So it's so fun to have it out in the world. And um, I appreciate you saying that you liked the voice because that is a challenge for me. I think it's more natural for me to write um, from an adult voice. And so, um, so this was a challenge, but one that I really enjoyed. Brooke, it sounds like we uh, both had a great time reading this summer. Uh, and now it's time to get back into reading for the show. I know. I'm excited. I have missed this and I'm ready to tackle some really fun topics and uh, get back in the swing of things. Excellent. And we want to hear what you read this summer. Reach out to us and let us know. But for now, thank you for joining us on Clued in Mystery. I'm Brooke. And I'm Sarah. And we both love mystery. Clued in Mystery is produced by Brooke Peterson and Sarah M. Stephen. Music is by Shane Ivers at SilvermanSound.com. Visit us online at CluedInMystery.com or social media at Clued in Mystery. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing, leaving a review, or telling your friends.